Right, so this is my little jig for testing my uh, bias tracking. She's warmed up quite nicely. I've got two MOSFETs here um, running source follower. You see there's 470 odd millivolts across 0.44 ohms of resistance, so that comes to just over an amp. 18 volt transformer, rectifier, some capacitors, they're sitting about 26 volts. They've both got about 13 volts across them, so they're both dissipating just over 13 watts. And they're getting quite hot, I'm gonna to have to turn them down in a sec. So this is the voltage actually at the gates of the transistors, that's what's needed to turn them on. So nine volts being needed between the two gates to generate 470 volts at the source terminals. So. This transistor is providing the thermal tracking. It's as uh, in my previous video, there's just um, a resistor from emitter to base, and I've got a potentiometer from base to collector, and then there's a resistor between collector and gate of the first FET. So some of the bias is being generated across that resistor, the rest is being generated and tracked by the. Um, should we have a bit of light in here? That might help. Rest is being generated by the uh, bias transistor. So yeah. So let's turn the bias down and see what happens. Let's put it down to 100 milliamps. So we want 44 millivolts. We'll take a second to stabilize because obviously as the dyes in the transistors cool down, that can happen a lot quicker than this contracting. This obviously has the thermal inertia of the heat sink it can track. So we can already see Transistors are dropping in bias a bit. They're starting to stabilize. What we should now see is the heat sink cools down This should stay relatively constant, but the voltage between the gates should start to rise So it might take a while so I can what I can do is I can just cheat for a second and show what happens if I spray the bias tracking transistor with a bit of spray You can see look wham straight up and once the spray all evaporates off and it uh, warms back up again. Yeah, there we go. So anyway, I'm going to let this cool down for five minutes. And uh, so at present we're 7.3 volts. And 0.44, so this is going to have to start rising to keep this constant as the heat sink, heat sink cools down. Okay, so this has had a while to cool down now. I've just popped a battery under it so it could get some proper airflow. Yeah, it's, it's slightly warmer than room temperature, so there's still some heat in it. You can feel it's warm. It's quite, you know, it's quite a nice temperature. As uh, can be seen on the meter here, look, this is now 110 millivolts above what it originally started at when it was hot, yet the bias has risen by, what was it, six? So five millivolts of bias, five to six. So yeah, 110 to five is a fairly decent ratio. It's uh, it's good enough. So yeah, I would set this to the bias I wanted. Obviously when you set bias, you, you set it. To start off with, it just goes wild. You, you, when you initially turn the amp on and set the bias, obviously things have to settle down. Is the dyes in the transistors warm up? They take a while to be tracked, and uh, everything sort of has to reach equilibrium. So you, you turn everything on, and you give it ten minutes or so. You just keep slowly tweaking the bias to where you want. Then after that, obviously with this one, is the amp warms up. If it's really pushed hard, then from Standard heatsink temperature, what we considered quite hot, uh, it wouldn't really get any hotter than I'd push this to. I should don't even get that hot. The heat sinks for this are massive. It's not being used in a PA use or whatever. So I should doubt you'll even get to that temperature. Well, I'm going to get, even under these conditions, from cold to barely being able to put my finger on it hot, uh, I had five millivolts of bias drift. drift. So I think. I'm happy with that as you can see here look this still just keeps climbing where I'm up to I've got to stop saying we this this is up to uh, this is now 120 millivolts above the cold bias yet the uh, actual bias across the transistors is only five, uh, five millivolts so yeah I might uh, I'm gonna power this off 
give it 10 minutes and then power it back on and see how long it takes to settle down. Um, so yeah, whilst this is cooling down, <coughs> I don't know if I've mentioned this in my last video, I don't think I did, but this is the board for the amplifier uh, I made. It's not as small as it could, but as you can see, I, I could have laid all the resistors side by side and squashed it down to sort of about half of the size of what it is. However, I went for optimization on track length and signal routing rather than size. So uh, yeah, was, you know, I'm, I'm not going to wing a track round and bring it back down when I can go across, then across the resistor it needs to be and up to somewhere else. Uh, size, you know, minimizing on size wasn't as important to me as it was optimizing on performance. So I felt it was worth the trade off on having a bigger size. Again, I could have still made it smaller than it is, but there's no need to. It's the heatsink for it is this piece. There's two of them, one each side of the amplifier. And the boards, it's for a bridge tied load amp, so there's two boards sit side by side. The transistors, the output actually come in from underneath and will the leads will be bent round, so they'll be sat just protruding above here. There is just enough room that the board's going to have to sit on spacers. The transistors, the body of the transistor will be underneath the board and the top tab, the metal bit you see with the screw will just be sticking up and there still will be a gap it'll just be sticking up and there'll be a gap above it so yeah that's um that's what the design's for so when i was testing this look um these capacitors uh i, I made up a like a replaced the battery on my little moped with them and uh i noticed on that it would. Uh, it took a while for them to form. When I first did it, it wouldn't hold any charge. Um, uh, you know, you'd park it up, come back to it a few hours later, there was nothing left of them at all. They were dead. Uh, and if, you know, just turn it off. If you turn it on just in neutral with the lights off, the neutral light would go after a few seconds. Well, after a few months and lots of riding, they, uh, they hold charge for, like, days and days and days. And, you know, if you turn the ignition on the neutral light, it'll run it for a good 30 seconds or so. So... They're obviously old caps which needed a while to form up. Well, I didn't give these a chance to form up. And I was doing tests on this and the bias just was dropping off and dropping. And it turned out it was the supply voltage collapsing massively because these caps were shorting internally. Well, I don't know about these two. I think this middle one might have been passively heated, but this end one all bulged out was untouchable. It was absolutely red hot and stunk. Uh, I think if I tried running it for much longer, if I'd walked away and left this to warm up, I think that would have exploded and left a hell of a mess all over my... Uh, table here so yeah if you got old caps let them form bring them up slowly sit them at half voltage for a day or so and then bring them up slowly to the rest of their voltage and you know you shouldn't really run caps at their maximum voltage they don't last very long so i was i would have been pushing these if they were good and new uh so yeah just a little something this is pretty cold now you see that there's no bias and the uh, this is just obviously like uh dielectric in the capacitors just holding a tiny bit of charge because the resistors across here are, are quite high uh it's very it's, it's you know by this point it's, it's going to be drawing very little they were there um 2k2 each so 4k4 and you can see when there's only a few millivolts they're only going to be drawing micro amperes of current so they're going to take a long time to fully discharge these cups but i'm going to turn it on at the plug and see what happens You see 7.23 volts between the gates when cold and the bias is 0.5, you see it's set fluctuating 0.55, so the bias is increased by 0.54, there we go. So the bias when it was hot was 0.46, so it's increased by 0.8. I have a look, 7.22, this was 7.03, so it's nearly... Uh, Nearly 200 millivolts more, um, nearly 200 millivolts more um, bias between the gates for, you know, yeah, hardly any change in bias at all. 200 millivolts needed to maintain the uh, 100 milliamps between the uh, gates between about 15 degrees and maybe about 50 degrees. So, 
Uh, it's tracking goes, I think that's pretty good. You can see, look, this is already starting to drop down. So obviously there's some, there's some amount of uh, thermal change happened already. Obviously, I would just say it's probably more self-heating in the transistors and that they're because obviously they're all passing current. They've got voltage across them. Um, so, obviously, yeah, it, it takes a second to settle down. But they are 0 0.050 from 0 0.46 hot to cold. I would call that OK on the scale of thermal tracking. So this is 470 ohm resistor this four, um, in the collector, 470 ohms in the emitter. And then whatever this works out to, I shall measure this. I shall put in a fixed resistance value of about half of what this is. So it gives me then, you know, it makes the adjustment less cost, especially with a 10 turn pot. I'll be able to fine tweak that adjustment quite easily. Um, see, so yeah, I don't know if I and I didn't, and I didn't touch on it. Obviously, in the video where I'm on about uh, what I'm trying to achieve, how to alter the temperature coefficient of the bias tracking transistor. Well, with a lower resistor, you have to have enough current, standing current in your. Uh, it's going to be no, usually in the voltage amplifier stage. But however you implement this, if you've got say six milliamps, and this lower resistor is only a hundred ohms, well, that's going to only be about 0.6 volts you can generate generate across this resistor. So your bias transistor will probably never do anything, even with it set to full adjust. All your bias is just going to be getting generated across your resistor; it won't track. Um, this being 470, there's 26, 27 volts across 4,400 ohms. So if it was across one kilo ohm, that would be uh, 27 milliamps. So 13 and a half, so you're about six and a half milliamps, something like that, six milliamps. So across 470 ohms, that would generate nearly three volts. So uh, yeah, plenty, plenty there. Most, uh, most of the current's gonna be passing through the bias transistor only a very small amount Ooh, what would that be at 0.6 volts is six about one just over 1.2 1.3 milliamps will be going through his resistor the other four and a half five will be getting passed through the bias transistor so yeah always make sure if you when you're um uh, designing a, a tracking circuit like this make sure that there is actually enough standing current to actually turn the transistor on if this bottom resistor is too low in value for the current you've got so if you only have one milliamp you'd, you'd need to keep this resistor really at, above a kilo ohm you'd, you'd probably want 2k2 or something um because you need to make sure even when it gets cold as that uh, base emitter voltage rises that there's still enough voltage across this to generate the uh voltage needed to bring this transistor into its forward uh, operating region so yeah, and you see it's uh, fairly constant. It's dropped to 7.17 and 0.49. So, yeah, I'm going to go with that. That's a good value of uh, bias setting for me. Obviously, a little different the voltage across these as it increases. More power will be dissipated within them. But it's the, the voltage from gate to source, really, that matters in determining what the standing current in them will be not so much the voltage across them so even on the higher supply voltage they're going to have double the voltage across them it just means for every milliamp of current they dissipate twice as much power but the actual difference between gate to uh, source voltage will be pretty much the same so uh yeah this this circuit uh, is about right where i need it so it turned out yeah 470 ohms in the collector circuit in series with the bias transistor so obviously the voltage across this resistor is always constant, so that's a that works out to I don't know, six milliamps through 470 ohms. It works out to like three volts or something is being generated across this resistor, and the rest of the bias is being generated across this transistor. So it's lowered the temperature coefficient of this considerably, uh, so it doesn't react as much and changes the temperature, and it's about where it needs to be to track these transistors uh, reliably and consistently there's a little experiment now it's cold i'm going to see what happens if i crank the bias right up uh, how well it maintains that tracking so i'm going to go 440 millivolts or so which is going to be uh, an amp so each of these transistors will dissipate about 13 watts there's some supply collapse 12 13 watts each so here we go
it's a bit coarse because it's not a multi-turn pot so it's very hard to so I'm going to try and get it somewhere near. I'm just going to leave it at that as you can see at present the dyes in the MOSFETs are heating up and the heatsink hasn't responded yet so the bias transistor hasn't had a chance to track anything yeah, there we go and so yeah there's some thermal change must be happening I can't really feel it with my finger but obviously yeah, the bias on between the gates is starting to drop and yeah, the overall bias is dropping, so there's a shift slightly, but uh, it's it's nothing major. Considering, like I said before, this would be this figure here. So this is two decimal, two places after the decimal point, and you know this is holding pretty steady. It's it's quite a ratio of change going on to maintain the um, actual standing current in this stage. So uh, more than acceptable. <laughs>